and they did a great job. And you know, I, I I can't say enough about Cirrus from the standpoint of a company. I mean, I've been a loyal customer of theirs since 2004, and they're just a great company. that's sitting out there on the ramp today is going to change aviation without a doubt. People don't recognize it right now because it's such a small delivery process but it is the only single engine jet made for general aviation or has ever been made for general aviation and for those of y'all who follow the process there was a time when the Eclipse jet was single engine, the Cirrus jet was single engine, Piper had a single engine one, I think Diamond had a Diamond single engine, yeah. all four of those were prototypes that they were developing and kind of competing for to get to the market first. And at the end of the day, there was only one survivor, and that was Cirrus. It came out with a wonderful design. But it took them, I mean, I put a deposit down on October 3rd, 2006. So it was 5,003 days from the time. <laughs> <laughs> And I gotta tell you, when I walked in that delivery hangar, I, I actually cried. You know, because it'd been that long to wait. So, anyway, Cirrus is a great company. I can't speak enough about Cirrus. Um, but then on August 22nd, I got a phone call from them and said, "Hey, are you willing to take delivery of your jet in November?" I said, "Heck yeah, I am." So, <laughs> but uh, that started a process of training. And the training, I mean, one thing that I think they uh, oversold is, <laughs> and it probably is the easiest transition there is from a single engine aircraft to a jet. But that doesn't mean it's easy. It just means that, you know, it's easier than that. Uh, yeah, Mount Kilimanjaro is a little bit lower than Mount Everest, you know, so. Uh, but, but the training process for me was difficult because of, I think a lot of it's my age. Yeah, I mean, thing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Uh, but I actually had I had four weeks of training over two and a half months. I made uh, four trips to Duluth. It included uh, a skill assessment where I took the SR-22 up there and, and flew with one of their test pilots, and he did a skill assessment where we went through different maneuvers so he could evaluate my level of, of, of skill. <clears throat> then I went into avionics training which was really tough because it's, even though it's Garmin, it's a touch screen and it has a different logic behind it than what the 1000 series had. Uh, and in that avionics training, they actually have uh, modules set up, uh, fake panels where you can sit there and do flight plans and stuff on an avionics panel and learn how, how to operate the systems without having to sit in an airplane. Uh, then I went into ground school, which lasted about a week along with all the written tests. Uh, then I got into a simulator which wasn't a, a 3D type simulator, you might see it sim flight. It doesn't have motion, but it's got everything else in it. And that's the first time when they prove to you that the plane is moving faster than you can think about. Because the first thing they do is they bust you on speed. Then they bust you on speed again, and then they bust you on speed again. Because the whole plane is about speed management. Um, but the simulator was cool, and then I actually got into flight training, where I was able to get in the aircraft with an instructor, for a period of five days and do a lot of simulated emergencies, do a lot of maneuvers, which progressed to the point of actually doing two dry runs with a new instructor. Because they wanted a new instructor to come in when you're doing your dry run for your check ride, because they, they don't want any, I guess, relationship between you and your instructor so that the new instructor can evaluate, are you ready for your check ride? So if you can go through your check ride and not make any busts and feel comfortable about the airplane, then Cirrus will sign you off and turn you over to the FAA and say, okay, he's ready for a check ride. And that's where the rubber meets the road. Because you have to uh, pass an oral test first, which was about a two-hour test, which included having to describe the systems to the examiner on a whiteboard where you actually have to draw out several of the systems of the aircraft and then I'll obviously answer a lot of questions about limitations, emergency procedures, things of that nature, because the examiner wants to make sure that you understand the airplane. Uh, then they give you a, uh, an example of your flight. They'll say, okay, we're going to go out, we're going to take off on this runway, we're going to do four approaches, the first two, we'll, we'll do an autopilot approach, we'll do an approach by hand, 
Uh, we'll do another autopilot approach. We'll do another approach by hand. Here are the approaches we're going to do. Here's the emergency procedures that you're going to be asked to be able to do. I may ask you all of them. I may ask you just a few. And then we're going to go do maneuvers. Um, and you've already prepared for all that stuff, you know, through your demonstration flights with your instructors. But he gives you about 30 minutes to plan your flight. And you got to do a weight and balance and a flight plan and prove to him that you understand the aircraft. And then you go out there and you really do it. And i got to tell you, my heart was beating, you know, a thousand beats a minute. Um, because you have to do it to ATP standards. And what that means is you're given uh, one bust, and if you bust, you're gone. And the bust is plus or minus 100 feet. So if he assigns you an altitude, and it's plus or minus 5 knots, and if he assigns you a speed, you've got to hit the altitude and maintain that altitude within 100 feet, and you have to uh, uh, maintain the speed plus or minus 5 knots. So you're always managing speed and you're always managing altitude, which isn't really hard with the autopilot, but you have to fly all your maneuvers by hand and you have to fly your emergency procedures by hand and you have to fly two of the approaches by hand. One of them is a non-precision approach, one of them is a precision approach. So, and, and the hardest one comes last and it's a circle to land VOR non-precision approach and you have to stay within 100 feet, plus or minus, and you have to uh, do it by hand. And it's about a, the one they chose was about a 10 minute approach because the entry you out in a pattern that you've got to do a teardrop entry. You've got to fly by hand, then you've got to do the approach, you've got to get down to minimums, and then you've got to do a circle to land. And so for about two and a half to three minutes, you've got to maintain that altitude at a low, at a low speed, at a low altitude in order to uh, you know, make make the grade, I guess is what you'd say it. And uh, so when we landed, the uh, the examiner said, hey, do you mind if I taxi in? I said, only if I passed. He said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, check ride was over, and I got to tell you, it took about three or four weeks for me to decompress, you know, to where I could just, you know, relax again. But, um, you know, I, I, I do think a younger person would do better at it. Um, it did take about between 50 and 60 hours before I became comfortable really with flying the airplane. Because part of the training required me to, to fly for a whole week, about 25 hours with a mentor, where you're not worried about a check ride because preparing for a check ride is different than preparing for flying the aircraft. Because a check ride, you have to do certain things. But flying the aircraft across the United States, it's a different set of parameters than just flying around the same airport. So the mentoring flight, uh, we went all the way out to Utah, Washington, California, and back over a period of eight days. And it was a great training experience. And, and really the three things that were the hardest was really the avionics first, uh, because there's a lot to it. The second thing is, is the systems, because in the SR-22 you didn't have retracts, you didn't have the anti-DI's. You didn't have the pressurization, you didn't have the environmental control systems, and you didn't have as many speed limitations as you do in the jet. So, uh, you know, the, the systems of the airplane was, was very difficult. But the third item was just the speed by which everything's happening. I mean, it's just boom, 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 and the air traffic controllers consider you a jet, and they expect certain things from you as far as speeds go and clearances. So. It's just a higher level of activity at a higher rate of speed. So those are the difficulties in trying to, you know, become a jet pilot. But it's something I've been waiting for for a long time. So I'm glad to be there and I'm glad it's over. Um, the performance of the aircraft, a couple of quick things about it. Uh, it loves to fly at 27 and 28,000 feet. And that's, that's where you fly, period just about regardless of anything other than temperature and wind and it has to be really strong wind and really low temperature not to go there uh, but at that altitude I've yet to see a true airspeed less than 300 knots usually it's about 305 to 310 knots true airspeed so if you got a tailwind you know you're kicking it plane although it's fast it, it slows down really fast if you need to slow it down indicated airspeed maximum is 250 knots indicated and th when I'm at flight 280 doing 305 true airspeed, the indicated airspeed is only about 160 to 165, okay? So you think about you're limited to 250 knots indicated airspeed. 
So the higher you go, the thinner the air, the lower your indicated airspeed. Where it really comes into play is on descent and down low. That's when the 250 knot limitation really comes into play. But you can throw the gear at 210. You can throw the first notch of flaps at 190, second notch of flaps at 150. So you can slow this plane down really fast. No speed brakes? No speed brakes. And you can get it down really fast as well. Plus, um, you can do an approach fast. I mean, I can do an approach at 180 knots, which is gear down, flaps 50%. So if I'm in a high traffic area and they want me to keep my speed up, I can do that. And then I can also slow it down real fast too. So, uh, like I said in the beginning, speed management in this aircraft becomes critical. We're in the SR-22, it, it really wasn't an issue. It was just a non-issue. Um, the cool thing about the plane is the mission profile that you can make with it. Because maximum zero fuel weight okay, allows me to put 1,165 pounds of passenger and gear in the plane. So think about that. Whereas an SR-22, that was about 400 to 500 pounds max. Okay, You're doubling the weight capacity of the airplane. And with 1,165 pounds of passengers and gear, I can put on 172 gallons of fuel, which gives me a two-hour flight and a small reserve. Small reserve is about a 30-minute reserve for, for that. So you need a little bit more to have IFR. But you could go an hour and 45 minutes of flight with a full payload of people, you know, and still have 45 minutes of reserves for IFR. So if it's VFR, you can go a little bit further. So you've got a lot of mission profiles that you can make with this airplane, but it also comes with a maximum landing weight. So from maximum gross weight at takeoff to maximum landing weight is a difference of about 450 pounds. So you've got to burn off about an hour's worth of fuel if you take off at maximum gross weight. So you always got to manage the weight of the aircraft too, which was something different, you know, than with the SR-22. So uh, that's a great asset to have now because you can do a lot of different. In addition to that, they have some great apps. I mean, they they gave us a flight planning app that does so much flight planning for you that it, it's really amazing. It makes flight planning easy. It takes a lot of guesswork out of it. It gives you the ability to make, you know, a good mission profile without spending a whole lot of time analyzing it. Um, I guess that's about it as far as what I wanted to speak.